Ah, oh, a gloriously rounded red burgundy. I'm getting smells of blackcurrant, damson, bramble. Oh, for Pete's sake, are you still at it? Now, I've only ever seen wine as something to drink, not talk about. So, in order to become a sophisticate, I've been touring France with a wine expert, Oz Clark. What's the first thing that comes into your mind about that wine? Fruit. <laughs> so far, I've taught James how to make wine, match food with wine, and even spot the difference between different styles of wine. It's not as strong as it smells, but the lingering aftertaste is more metallic. It tastes more stainless steel. He's definitely learning, but this week, things are about to get more difficult as I test him on a tricky concept that lies at the very heart of French wine. French terroir, English cobblers. This week, we're starting off in one of France's less well-known wine regions, Alsace. At the far east of France, next to Germany, and sometimes in it, Alsace is most famous for its Rieslings. Mention the name Riesling and many people go, yuck, horrible, semi-sweet, German. But in fact, Alsace Rieslings are dry, balanced and intense. Das ist ein Weinfakt. We've now been on the road for almost a month and I'm hoping James has progressed enough to cope with the next stage of my lesson plan. Right, what have you got lined up for me today? I've got a concept. It's a concept called terroir. 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 You've got to think slightly French. Terroir. This sounds pretty French and flabby already. Well, yes, terroir is very French, and there's not really any English word that can simply sum it up. Basically, it's a catch-all way to describe the many factors of sun and soil, wind and water that can influence the quality of a vineyard and hence the taste of a wine. It's basically because the soil is very special. The aspect of the sun is very special. The amount of rain they get is reduced. The amount of wind they get is reduced. The angle to the sun is just right. All those sorts of things um, actually contribute to a different flavour in the wine. So that eventually, you take a glass of wine and you think, I have no idea what Great Friday this was made from, but I can taste something rather exciting and rather challenging in the wine. The excitement just... of getting wines here, which actually pose questions rather than make statements. They're oh, asking something to say. That, that is so... I'm sorry, Clark, I'm going to have to blow my whistle. That's just wishy-washy. James, it's not. That's great it's mysticism. A, no, it's a fantastic wine idea. Wines that pose questions. It's I, a fantastic I have a question for a bottle of wine. Will you get me a bit drunk? Will you help me relax and make amusing conversation with people I like? That's the question I pose for the wine. I don't want the wine to come to me and say, well, am I calm? Is it flinty? Is it sunny? I don't give a pig's ass, frankly. Where do I go? I'm hoping James will be a little more infused when we reach our first destination. It's a famously steep vineyard called the Rangan of Tarn, where the terroir is so remarkable that the wine made here can command around 50 pounds a bottle. There's a rather large lump of rock in the road, which you may or may not. Here's a big one. Watch it. You see it? Oh! Ah! This car is too low for some of these roads and it's constantly just slightly grounding and now whatever that little lump is in the middle of the road has clouted the exhaust and split it in half. It was your fault. Uh, what? You made me come up here. You said let's go and look at the steepest vineyard in Germany or wherever it is. I said I didn't actually expect that there'd be a, a lump of metal aggressively and maliciously sticking up in the middle of the road. This is bad. We need some help. Um, we're down a tiny lane in Alsace. Uh, we're right next to a very famous vineyard on a very steep slope. Now, I can't remember what it's called, but it makes wines that are very, very crisp and they have a very exciting flavour. James, are you able to take in any wine facts at the moment? No. Well, I'll try. This is called the Rangan Vineyard in a town called Tang. It is one of the steepest vineyards in France. It's a thrilling place. 
the steepness means that it sucks in all the sunshine from morning to lunchtime to evening. It's got black volcanic acid soils, which means that the wine, the, 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 the soil soaks up the sun, and it means that the vines really pack in all that heat, creating tremendous intensity in the grapes. And the, the wines are so intense when you taste them, you actually don't even, you can't even tell what grape variety they're made from. You just taste this enormous concentration of the sense of place, of, of the terroir in effect. Have you got any of this wine with you? Not yet, but Not uh, just bear, day, bear, bear, bear with me. It bends a little. Donc, si vous le tirez trop vers là, il faudra plus l'accrocher après dedans. Nous ne voulons revenir vers là. Là, c'est bon. Encore un centimètre et puis euh, il ne pourra plus le, le mettre dedans. Four blokes, two hours and some wine bribery later, the exhaust is fixed. But seeing as we're now way behind schedule, we're going to have to leave the Rangan vineyard and we'll continue the terroir trail at our next stop. Close to the town of Kaiserberg is Domain Weinbach. They're Riesling, the fantastically titled Grand Cru Schlossberg Cuvée Saint Catherine, costs around £20. Uh, the concentrated, minerally flavour comes from the granite soil and steep, south-facing slope of its vineyard. I'm hoping the daughter of the domain, Catherine Faller, will explain. And I'm not really interested. All I want is the one thing France seems unable to provide, a cup of tea. Oh. Bonjour. 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 Mamza. Nice to meet you. Catherine Faller. Catherine. Nice to meet you. James. Hello. So you bring us the sun or? No, we bring you the clouds. London clouds. Yeah, oh. we bring you the Les Mauvais Trompe Anglaise. Oh. Do you have, Don Le Chateau? Yes. A cup of tea. A cup of tea, yes. It may seem rather presumptuous. I'm only on the doorstep of your fine home, but I'm so desperate for a cup of tea. You want to see? Yes, please. Oh, You're such a smooth talker, James. In you go. Dear, oh dear. Ooh. It smells excellent. Yeah. It's got very good terroir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Madame has allowed me to make a cup of tea using all her tea making equipment. And we have arrived at the fundamental problem with French tea making, which is that they genuinely don't believe the water should boil. They think it should be warm. And we've had this discussion three or four times. She said, it must not be too hot. I said, no, no, it must boil. This is cast iron. So it has a very high specific heat capacity, so we need to get it very hot first, otherwise all the heat from the water will go into the pot and it won't be making the tea. But if we preheat this, this may seem like waffle, but it's nothing compared with what I've had to listen to about terroir. You have to wait exactly how long you have to become familiar with your tea and your teapot. But r roughly somewhere between three and four and a half minutes will make perfect infusion then it's ready for pouring, so all we can do now is wait. Right, if we could have silence, please, everybody. This is a seminal moment, the Im most important event in the culinary history of France since the cheese and ham toasty was stolen from our archers at Agincourt and renamed the croque monsieur. That looks like tea. It's thin tea, but it is tea. I love you. <laughs> because of the tea? Mm. Is it good? Yes. Well. I may weep. With James happy, now he's got his fix of Darjeeling, we can finally hit Catherine's incredible cellar. All Domain Weinbach's wines are fermented in these huge, hundred-year-old barrels, which encourages them to retain the distinct flavours of their individual terroir. The fermentation takes place just, well, it starts in October, and until the wines are bottled and the bottling takes place in spring, let us say it starts in May. So they all stay here? They all stay here. And the wood gives yes. no flavour? No, because it's old. Because we want to stay away from new wood. 
because mm. our wines don't need flavor resistance brought by new wood, you know, because they are they have a great purity of fruit. So how many bottles of wine do you get out of a single barrel? Um, about 7,000 bottles of wine. Well, wow. how do you keep barrels clean when they're 100 years old? Well, they are washed with high pressure water. Inside. And our uh, cellar master goes in to clean them. So he goes in there? This is removed. This is removed. The door is also removed. And then we go in the cellar and we clean them. You can get a man through that hole? Yes, so if the shoulders go in, the rest People all follow. Go in. Yes. What side were it on? Shoulders. You've got to be pretty, pretty bendy and mm. thin. Yeah, it's essentially Billy Smart Circus or here. That's it? That's your career. It's a tough one. Mm. I'd come here. Sure would I. Well, if the scouring midget's gone to all that effort, it would be rude not to try some of the wine. I think that we're ready here for a wine moment. So this is a Riesling grape yes. in a barrel, fermented in a barrel, up to 100 years old, cleaned by the circus midget man, um, who may still be in there, for all we know. And it's not aged in oak barrels, and it's not tampered with or any of that thing. This is fermented grape juice. Riesling. Right, let's have a go. Riesling. That's far too difficult to say. Let's see if it's nice. You see, if I had to describe that in my way, I would say that's quite a brittle taste. You put it in your mouth and it, and it shatters slightly and it has sharp edges, whereas some of those oak-aged ones that you, you gave me, they stay in your mouth in one ball that rolls around in your mouth, but this goes into little shards that go around your mouth and, mm -hmm. and sort of exfoliate. So, so you mean it cleanses your palate? Yeah, it's very a wine from an, a big new oaky wine actually sort of coats your palate in clag. Mm. Yes, this, exactly. this scours exactly. the clag mm. off it. Mm. I'd use this to brush my teeth as well because it would be very cleansing. Of the, well, I'm sorry, I wouldn't to use it to brush my teeth. But each time you taste it, it's changing. This one now has got a sort of floral kind of smell. And I don't know, do you get a tiny smell of really beautiful unsmoked tobacco about it? Mm. It's clean. That's what I'd say. It's a clean wine. It's unsullied. It's gothic. Gothic. I like that. Another glass and off he goes. Champion. You know, this wine thing, you've got these thousands of years of history of France and the vineyards, and then you've got all the terroir stuff, and it goes in these barrels, and it stays in there, and it ferments in a certain way, and then it has to go in the bottle, and it might stay in the bottle for one year, but it might stay in the bottle for five or ten years in a dark, dank cupboard under the stairs, and eventually you drink it. I think at that point... You have to put it in the glass, and there's a, there's a certain sense in just slamming it down your throat. It goes wham down the funnel of time into my mouth, into my throat. That's what makes it exciting. Yes. James is actually really the finding sense, his way into yeah. this yeah. world of wine of mine, this culture of wine. He's actually getting the bug. Now, it's, it's a fascinating thing for me to watch him, because from just standing there a few years ago and saying, this is a rubbish old poppycock, he now is the one who stands forth there like an orator and gives great, big, passionate speeches about a philosophy, which is his own philosophy, and he's very keen to create a little world of fantasy around a wine. I mean, he's actually becoming a little bit of a wine buff. We'll find out just how far he's come later on when, as usual, I'll be testing him out. If you're looking in the high street for Alsace wines, many of the most affordable ones come from the Carve de Turkheim. You'll see it on the label. There are some very good ones for under a tenner. Armed with three fine examples ourselves, we've come to our next terroir, the campsite. Camping with Oz is a truly woeful experience, and I think we are something of an embarrassment to Britain. I'm getting somewhere with this, to be honest. You've done this before, James, haven't you? But I know, I'm not asking for help. Uh, I can't find a hole. I don't know. I have to move the whole damn thing back out again. So uh, it sort of goes. It makes a. You want you want the riesling. Shall I creep? Yep. This is actually going better than I expected. 
Sick. She sells seashells. Do you know that? Of course you know that. She sells seashells on the seashore. The shells, seashells, seashells are seashells, I'm sure. <laughs> Start again. I touch you, you touch again. Me again. I can't stop it. It's my theatrical background. There was a barber and his wife, and she was beautiful. A foolish barber and his wife. She was his meaning and his life, and she was beautiful, and she was virtuous, and he was naive. Designed this tent. I don't understand why the tent is pointy at one end. And it's uncomfortable and I hate it. And as soon as Clark's up, I'm putting a match to it. I simply don't know how people can have two weeks holiday in these things. You don't get any sleep. James burps and farts all night. Moves around like a bloody walrus. It's not designed for sleeping in. Rubbish. This morning, we're crossing over the Vosges Mountains and heading west to Burgundy, world famous for producing wines such as Meursault and Nuit Saint-Georges. Here, the concept of terroir is so important that it can literally add hundreds of pounds to the price of a bottle of wine, as James is about to find out. This tiny little crossroad here is one of my favourite places in, in the whole wine world because it absolutely shows how crucially important bits of land are in this French concept of terroir. Now look, this vineyard here, this vineyard here is called, that's called the Le Mont Rache vineyard. That makes the most expensive white wine in the world. It can be a thousand pounds a bottle, okay? Over the road here, you've got, the, what is it, ten yards can't be more. This is another entirely different vineyard, but only 10 yards away, you'll never get more than about 40 pounds a bottle for this vineyard here. Over here, you've got this vineyard over here, and this is another one, another famous vineyard. This is called the Batar Monrache, the sort of bastard Monrache, still very good, about 250 pounds a bottle. You know, it's only the side of a road and you've lost three quarters of its value already. This one here is another one. It's about 200 pounds a bottle. Do you see how we're only a couple of meters further down the hill? Already it's less valuable, all because of the way that the soils change, the aspect to the sun change, the drainage changes, the flavor in the grapes change. I don't believe it. How can it actually make that much? I mean, I've heard all this stuff before about, do you go over the wall and the wine is Amish? But how can it actually make, I mean, when the earth was created, there can't have been that much difference between the soil there and the soil there. And the sun is in the sky and it cannot shine very differently on that bit and that bit. It's, it, there's just not it changes it absolutely does. I, I can take you into that vineyard now and the place is solid limestone because the, you know, men over thousands of years have worked this out. The flavours you get from that vineyard are just more intense. When you get down here, they're paler, they're milder, they're more dilute. And eventually, with wine connoisseurs, they will eventually play for rarity and concentration of flavour. OK, so that's Mon yeah, yeah. Right, so that's up to £1,000 a bottle. Yeah. And that's, uh, what grape is that? The Chardonnay. Chardonnay? You know, you meet people, I've met them, they get very snooty about wine. They say, oh, I don't drink South African Chardonnay, I prefer uh, Chablis. They're the same thing. They're, they're, they're both Chardonnay great wines. It's just that in the New World, they put the grape on the label, and in France, they put Montrachet on the label. That's crucial. That's Old a wine world, fact. That's a wine. OK, I'll give it to you. That's a wine fact. Old world attitude versus new world attitude. The old world idea is the place is more important, what the French call this terroir. The new world attitude is the grape is more important, and we'll talk about the place later. But in White Burgundy, and White Burgundy goes from Chablis in the north to famous names like Merceau and Montrachet in the middle, to famous names like Puy Fuisse in the south, they're all made from the Chardonnay. That's what makes White Burgundy. A thousand pounds a bottle, eh? That's about eight pounds a grape. Right, I'll have some of that. Get moving, mate. Get off my vineyard. Oh. 
Soon, I'll be challenging James to show me exactly what he's learned over the past few days. But first, a quick deviation to visit a Burgundy institution. It's a place that's as important to the creation of fine wine as any terroir, and we're getting a rare peep inside. We're at Francois Frere, and they're barrel makers. They're probably one of the most famous barrel makers in the world. And I brought James here because I want him to understand the enormous effect that aging a wine in oak barrels or fermenting a wine in oak barrels has on the wine. It gives the wine an enormously extra rich flavor of vanilla, of spices, of toast, of chocolate, of cashew nuts, all those kind of flavors. Whenever you find them in great, fine, exciting wines, all that flavor is coming from the oak barrel. Oz Clark, I believe, was actually around at the barrel making business ever since. So he's brought me here to assemble a barrel, which uh, he probably thinks is purgatory and another attempt to make me live in the Middle Ages. But actually, I'm really looking forward to it because I like sort of woodwork and making stuff, and it's terrific. It's a knockout over on Oz's side of the process. That backfired on him a bit, really. I suppose what I learned from that was something Oz told me, which is that the oak barrel imparts that very soft vanilla flavour to the wine, well, more of a vanilla smell. And um, you can see why, as soon as you walk in there and wood's being sawn and, and planed and so on, you do get that freshly cut oak smell in the oak. And that's what's going into the wine. If you age your wine in an oak barrel, not all of them are. It's really for quite expensive wines. If you're going to spend a fiver on a, a bottle of wine, it's unlikely to have been aged in an oak barrel. So you will never be able to pick up a wine and drink it and, and sense instinctively that that came out of a barrel that James... Our final destination, and the place where James will be tested out, is the vineyard of a young winemaker in Jouvray Chambertin, one of the most celebrated... Burgundy. This bloke that Oz is talking to is called Terry Beaumont. He used to be something very big in motorcycle racing, which is quite encouraging. Unfortunately, he doesn't do that anymore. He now owns and runs vineyards in Burgundy, and um, he wants to talk to us about terroir. Thierry's best terroir is here, above the road. His next best is directly below the road, and his third best is down on the flats, near to where that little white van is tootling along. The price difference between that vineyard there and this vineyard here will be £100 a bottle, £35 a bottle maybe, just the side of a road. When you test the wine of, the, of these two places, yeah. it's, it's different. Something that I really can't get my head around with this whole terroir thing is that they're so obsessed with the subtle differences that a different amount of clay or a different amount of gravel makes or a slightly different angle of the sun, and yet these priceless prime grand premier crew vineyards, or whatever they are, are bisected by this main road down which drive very old Peugeot diesel. Here comes one. Here we go. Here's a nice van with diesel fumes coming out. Now, surely that's going to make a bigger difference than any of this... Oh, you see the oh, ah, oh, melt diesel. But no, they never mention that. Here is what I've learned about terroir. It's it's a French word with no actual English equivalent, so it doesn't appear presumably in the little pocket gem French English dictionary. But it probably should. I could write the entry for them. It will say French terroir. English cobblers. You're wrong, James. Terroir, the precise place that grapes are grown, can make a massive difference to the taste of a wine. And I'm hoping the results of this test will prove that I'm right.
what I'll ask Terry to do is to take three different samples of wine, one from his best vineyard above the road, one from his next best vineyard below the road, and one from his least good vineyard down on the flat. We're going to put all the glasses up and see whether James can tell the difference between them. The thing about the Tawar, I suppose the experts will say that you'll be able to taste the, you know, the, the better quality soil. I can't remember how Terry put it, but it's what the soil does to the grape which makes a difference. Now, I don't know if I will honestly be able to taste that. I will know which one I like best. And if it turns out that I have naturally expensive and aristocratic taste, that one will be the Grand Cru from above the road up the hill. James is in some pretty impressive company. These Chambertin vineyards were a favorite of Napoleon Bonaparte himself. Will James May be able to match up? <coughs> Quiet, please. Right, gentlemen, I believe that is from above the road, that is from below the road, and that is the plonk off the flat stuff. Is it? Yes. Correct. You're the winner. <laughs> it's easy. You are learning. You could say it's luck. You could say it's just beginner's sort of chance. But I'm not so sure. I mean, he's been bending my ear day after day about terroir and all of it, trying to understand what on earth it is. And I've been going backwards and forwards. And bit by bit, he's getting the message. This is still, uh, has a marvellous flavour, but it's quite sort of light and happy. It's a happy wine. Yes, you, you know, Sprightly. It. The thing that really annoys me about this is that, well, there's two things. One, it means that all Oz Clark's pontification is actually of some merit. And the second thing is, if this goes on much longer, he is going to turn me into a wine ponce, and I'm going to start thinking, no, no, I don't want the plonk from down the hill on the flat, but I want the stuff from above the road, please. It's going to cost me a fortune, and I'm going to end my days with a red nose living in a skip. That would go very well with it. Petrol station, Cornish pasty. I don't know why I bother sometimes. For more information and another futile attempt to explain terroir, go to bbc.co.uk forward slash food. Next week, it's the final leg of our big wine adventure as we go out with a bang in Champagne. Those bottles are desperate to be drunk. Their mission in the world is to leap out of that bottle at a party and help two people have sexual intercourse. <laughs>